So I'd like to start off my, my presentation today talking about the journey, the means to ultimately these technological ends. And if you have a shared problem, it also creates the opportunity for shared solutions. And in fact, in our space, it's, it's, it's racked by market failure. So the only way that we're able to sort of ensure a strong innovation pipeline is by working together. And that's epitomised through the Invasive Animals Copy Research Centre that brings together all the state and territory governments, uh, bar the NT, the Australian government, uh, a number of industry uh, RDCs, and so in particular we have Australian Wool Innovation, Meat and Livestock Australia and the Grains RDC, providing that strong sort of industry dynamic. A commercialiser, that's Animal Control Technologies, that's leading our, our bait development technology, as well as you can sort of see a number of international uh, partners. And I, and I do want to sort of like highlight the the reason why they're in our CRC and, and in fact how they're adding a lot of value to the Australian uh, experience. So really important, we need to sort of create collaborative ventures if we're going to sort of achieve high impact solutions. So I wanted to start off uh, just with one of, one of my little favourite pictures which is uh, two pigs sort of having a stoush for a, a free feed. And the point that I want to make here is that when we're looking at pest animal control from a strategic baiting point of view, the mainstay is, is 1080 control. And so the role for a CRC and, and in fact uh, for our partners is to look at how you can add new tools into the toolkit that can complement um, regional 1080 baiting. Uh, in, that, in that space, we've been fortunate to have a very strong partnership with Meat and Livestock Australia, and I think Cameron may talk a little bit later on about this partnership. And, and in that, we're developing a new technology based on sodium nitrite. And, uh, and many of you have, may have heard of it before, but sodium nitrite is, the, is a very common human food preservative found in bacon. Uh, we metabolise it. Pigs don't have that enzyme. They can't metabolise it. They're very sensitive. They fall asleep. They die. And, uh, and what we want to say here is that whilst these three slides capture the broad process, this is a 10-year sort of technology pipeline. This is a 10-year sort of process of, of challenges, technical challenges, uh, dealing with sort of drought, rain, I mean, really trying to sort of work through a lot of these issues. So every technology I present today is not just a simple sort of uh, walk in the park. It represents a long period of innovation and uh, from concept through to market. The, uh, the other important point I'd like to raise here is that you'll see that the broad number of collaborators, which include uh, a couple from uh, the US and, uh, and also a partner from New Zealand, they're all members of our CRC. And, and importantly, as Australia has sort of rolled back its infrastructure around um, large vertebrate pest uh, uh, enclosures, we had to look elsewhere. And, and for us, we had to look to the US that actually have these, uh, this infrastructure in place in Texas. And so what HOGON represents is a, is a combination of technology sort of trialled both in the US and in Texas, as well as in Australia and in situ with, uh, with our collaboration with the Queensland uh, Murray-Darling Committee. So this is really important, is that we need to think globally around sort of the shared problems because ultimately we need to share infrastructure, we need to share capability. Uh, this, this sort of technology works like a treat. It usually kills uh, pigs in, in around about two hours. Uh, it is humane. And, uh, and from, a, you know, from a, an efficacy point of view, we're getting sort of you know, well into the 80s. I mean, this is a really good product. And we're now about to sort of submit an APVMA registration package. So long, long journey, a difficult journey, but we're nearly there. Uh, so, so to sort of take that sort of technology sort of class forward, I'd now like to talk about what we're doing in the, in the dog space. And in fact, once I sort of talk about baits, I'll then sort of move to also talk about uh, the role of, of digital sort of technologies and then finish with the, with the, with the biocontrol work that, uh, that has been driven through the CRC that, uh, that Matt related in his introductory remarks. So when we talk about wild dogs, again, 1080 is the, is the mainstay, but how do we add sort of an additional tool into the toolbox? And that's been through a very strong partnership with Australian Wool Innovation and our commercialiser, Animal Control Technologies. Uh, this works in a very similar way to, to sodium nitrite. It simply prevents uh, the, from oxygen binding to haemoglobin and the animal falls asleep. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very sort of humane toxin. And this wouldn't have been achieved without the strong financial and other support that we received from farmers through their levies through wool innovation. 
Again, a long time coming, uh, and it's a very good product. It's now available uh, for sale not only in New South Wales and Victoria, but also Queensland. So Queensland Health approved uh, the availability of this product last week. So a really, a really good example. But when we talk about tools, we also need to talk about the appropriate management scale. And, uh, and, and to put this in sharp relief, I'd like to just to, to highlight if, I, if this little buzzer works. OK, so I'm having a technical issue. But what this line represents is, the, is a wild dog that was captured uh, near Coffs Harbour. And you can sort of see it went on its long run uh, right down to, oh, OK, OK, I'm back again, uh, to Bell Bellbrook, and then it goes up north. That's, that's an 800 kilometre journey, and, uh, and midnight is still moving. And what it highlights is that if you're going to effectively manage a pest like wild dogs, you have to manage at the right scale. So where we started off at the start of our cooperative research centre in, the, in, in 2005 was, was looking at a, a good example of where that uh, was born out at a smaller scale. And in fact, it was near Canberra, it was Wee Jasper. And it was, it was recognised that if you took a nil tenure approach, if governments through their, their, their park rangers worked cooperatively with landholders and the like, uh, and you manage at that regional scale, you could deliver solid regional results. And, and this is sort of like proof in the pudding that at, over time, through a consistent effort, you're going to sort of reduce, wild, uh, you're going to reduce sheep impacts to a, a manageable level. So, so what we actually trialled in, in our sort of CRC was, was rolling that nil tenure approach out nationally. And we did that through our, our national wild dog facilitator, so Greg Misford may be known to a number of you, and he's been working cooperatively with, with state and regional sort of government bodies, uh, community groups, to really promote that, that nil tenure approach. And it's, uh, it's delivering very solid dividends. We're getting strong uptake, we're seeing sustained benefit. And, and this is a really important point, is that you're producing the tools, but you're embedding that within an appropriately managed um, regional plan. Where do we take it forward is the New England is, is prime sheep country. It's an area that over the last decade or two has, has suffered increasing sort of wild dog attacks. And it's a space where, where the CRC has been working through our partners, New South Wales DPI, Wool Innovation, a number of others, uh, including the University of New England, to look at how you can start managing at scale. And this is an aspiration. This is actually where we'd like to sort of take an offensive strategic baiting approach right to, uh, right to the wild dog problem. So we can create a solution at scale that's sustainable over the long term. Uh, it's, re it's called reset because it's all about resetting the compass to back where the wild dog issue was uh, in the 60s and so on before, the the, in a sense, before sort of the, the um, how do you say, we took the, sort of the, the foot off the pedal and we've seen wild dog issues gradually increase to a point now where they're, they're very significant and we need to sort of return to where we were. So you can sort of see if this reset project gets up and that's proposed um, through our new centre, uh, it actually will ideally sort of look at how to sort of capture um, wild dog, effective wild dog management from Dubbo in the east right through to Ballina, uh, sort of in the north. And part of that is that it's not a government-led uh, exercise. It's actually government, industry, community-led. And I think, importantly, as we sort of really look at the, the biosecurity issue, it's trying to sort of operationalise a shared responsibility framework. And, and what the CRC has, has been doing is, is developing a range of community-led facilitators, and I highlighted the role of, of Greg Misford uh, in, in mobilising and catalysing sort of these community-led efforts. But we're also providing digital planning and decision support tools that are being rolled out. Because at the end of the day, unless you enable communities, all you're doing is you're, you're setting communities up for failure. So one of the things that we've been looking at is wild dog scan. And, and that's a, a regional mapping and planning tool that feeds in and, and makes uh, the community-led regional mapping process and planning process efficient. Uh, and an important feature, it enables also uh, the new records of wild dog 
presence, impacts to be shared, and, and this is one of the sort of areas that we'd like to move into in our new centre, is how do we make it real time? If you actually detect a wild dog or a, or a wild dog impact, how do you sort of enable that, that point to be shared with all the other members of your local uh, wild dog association? And, and these are features that, uh, that can be built into, the, into this new wild, wild dog scan platform, and they're important developments if we're going to sort of really operationalise the shared responsibility framework. Um, taking that to a, sort of a, another level is, as I sort of flagged, that alert system is all about a, an individual uh, automatically or sort of remotely and manually putting that, 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 uh, that data point into a wild dog uh, map and then that being communicated. Where, where is digital agriculture going to take us? Uh, in our space, one of the real opportunities is to, is to look at the role of these remote automated technologies in our, in our case, based on camera trap technology. And, and this is sort of like a, a wiring diagram for our wild dog alert system, and that project is underway as a collaboration between the Australian government, uh, Meat Livestock Australia, Wool Innovation, and importantly, a very strong sort of partnership between New South Wales DPI and the University of New England. And as you can sort of see through the, the schema, um, we're really looking at, at putting camera traps at very at vulnerable points in your fence line, uh, you detect the, the, the wild dog, it then sort of sends out a, a signal which is, then in, which is then automatically interpreted and this is the genius that is being worked up through the University of New England is that they're actually working up all the facial recognition algorithms to ensure that you get high sort of uh, probability detection of, of wild dogs, all done sort of remotely, done automatically. It ultimately enables the farmer to have a preemptive strike capability and, uh, and get the dog before the dog starts taking out the sheep. And, and to give you a very good example is one of the, the inspirations for this was uh, our project where we were radio, uh, radio sort of collaring uh, a number of wild dogs. One of those went into a property uh, just near Walker in that, in that New England area that I showed you. It then sort of remained on that property for around about two weeks before it started to attack and kill sheep. So you had really had a two-week window if you were able to, to uh, pr no, detect that dog coming through a breach in the fence uh, early on. So this is the value of this wild dog alert uh, technology. So how does it work? Um, it, it's, very, it's very clever, but just running through the sort of the, the process, it's, it's all about sort of developing algorithms and, and, uh, and transposing technologies that are developed for security applications and moving them into our space. So a lot of this work is sort of you know, riding on the coattails of very big investments in this space in defence, in security, and looking at how we can adapt those technologies for more efficient uh, and real-time pest animal management. So, so this is sort of like um, an example. It then goes down to the, 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 the facial level, and, and we're literally getting sort of over 80% recognition. This is, this is really exciting stuff. Um, where we are potentially as we sort of move into the new centre is, is starting to deploy this technology for other pest species. Uh, you know, really looking at how we can take uh, this technology to, to its maximum sort of extreme uh, so that we can really provide those efficient tools for land managers. Now I'd like to sort of finish with, uh, with our rabbit story. And, uh, and as Matt sort of flagged, in the 1920s, there were some 10 billion rabbits, an estimated 10 billion rabbits. If you then sort of convert that into sort of a, a, a sheep equivalent, recognising that nine or 10 rabbits equals one sheep, it gives you a sense of just the, the lost productivity that was occurring pre-biocontrol. It was absolutely astronomical. Farmers were walking away from their land. Uh, we needed that sort of that strategic technology. And, uh, and where we sort of, where we were sort of, were, were really sort of, um, at that coal air, at that sort of that that that, uh, that coal front, was was you know at the landholder level. This is one night sort of collection of rabbits, uh, and this is in fact from uh, the the David Lord property that I think Cameron will be mentioning. But you can just imagine how many sort of sheep equivalent uh, were were not able to be sort of stocked because of just this one night supply of dead rabbits. So what are we doing within our collaborative research centre? Um, what we've been doing is bringing together all the key players, so state and territory governments, Commonwealth governments, we're bringing together wool innovation and meat and livestock, so strong industry partnership. We're bringing in our international partners, so that's New Zealand Landcare Research, 
And we're sort of, we've formed this very strong collaboration, which is all about developing a pipeline. It's based on the premise that there are no, there's no sort of silver bullets in this space. We need a pipeline of agents, one ready to go every 10 years or so, if we're going to keep on top of the rabbit problem. So in this, I mean, CSIRO has played a leading role in bringing together the players to come up with a, our 20-year uh, pipeline strategy, and that's what that document is on the on the the right-hand side, and you know, and Will and the support of others through the Invasive Plants and Animals Committee have got behind this this 20-year sort of strategy. So how does that translate? Um, and this is this gives you an example of just the absolute benefit of of biocontrol. You know, pre-mixo, huge drop, 98 odd percent. Uh, you're gradually seeing genetic resistance take off. Uh, and the important thing is that I often get charged with the, with the, the, the fact that Mixo doesn't work anymore. Mixo doesn't kill 98% of the rabbits anymore. It still kills about 50% or half of all rabbits born. It is still a really effective biocontrol agent, but not enough to suppress the population. Without Mixo, you, know, you can imagine, would we be going back to those $10 billion, sorry, 10 billion um, population of rabbits? So, so that's something to recognise. Even though the, the, the effectiveness attenuates, we still have huge benefits coming through from each of these agents. You can sort of see the gradual increase, the release of, of Khaleesi virus in the mid-90s, and you can sort of see we're now on the upward path of, of, of resistance. That's the, that was the premise behind sort of our, our first five-year plan. And it started off with a recognition that when we released Khaleesi virus, it worked like a treat. I mean, high 90% knockdowns in the arid areas, uh, in the higher production areas of Australia, we, we, it didn't work to specifications. So the first sort of, uh, the first project in our, in our large investment was to sort of enable CSIRO to work out what was going wrong. And what they discovered, that there was actually a benign virus called RCVA1 that had been brought in in the first fleet. And that was uh, prevalent in, in the high production areas of Australia and was reducing uh, Khaleesi virus effectiveness by giving partial immunity to, to rabbits. So that was the lock that, uh, that was the starting point for, for the current CRC uh, rabbit program. And you can sort of see that that enabled us to start to look at, well, what's the first cab off the rank? It's to do a global search of overseas, uh, naturally occurring overseas strains of Khaleesi virus to try and find the one or more strains that are going to basically deal with that lock, to be the key to that lock. And, uh, and that was ultimately through a, an evaluation of 38 variants. We landed on, on the fifth uh, sort of strain from Victoria that was looked at, which was then aptly named the K5 strain. The other part of this story was, was that do you, do you sort of distribute um, the Khaleesi virus in the old way, which is uh, as, a, as a hazardous good on, on dry ice, or do you try and find a more efficient uh, delivery mechanism? And that was the, that was the other prong of, of, our, of our sort of uh, technology platform, is trying to develop a freeze-dried version. So basically two elements to the key. And, uh, and, I, and I need to say that it has been a, a remarkable success. So we've now put out the first new uh, biocontrol agent in, in, in 20 years, delivered through not only government agencies and, and, and under the auspices of the Invasive Plants and Animals Committee, but importantly, as I, I sort of flagged earlier, in terms of this, this emerging biosecurity paradigm, it's been delivered as a very strong government industry community partnership. So 600 release sites, they're all community release sites. And, uh, and, and if we have a look here, this is, this is the Victorian release, and uh, that's John Matthews, who's uh, within Vic, Vic DPI. And what he's, he's actually about, he's about to send off via, through the post uh, our freeze-dry technology. And so instead of sort of sending it off as a hazardous good on dry ice at, at quite significant cost, it's basically just been bunged out through the, through the post to the, to the release, uh, release nodes. So you know, this, is, this is the example of how these technologies come together in practice. Uh, we, don't, no, we no longer have hundreds of extension staff, you know, like um, scientists on tap. I mean, it, it is a very frugal innovation platform that we have now in Australia. So what that means is that we have to rely on, again, land, landholders, farmers and others involved in the rollout to provide us with the samples of 
rabbits beforehand and also rabbits post-release. And this is the, you know, basically the, the monitoring kit that went out to all the land managers that were involved in our release. Uh, so what they do, for a, if they get a free vial, and that's compliments of um, the, the deputy PM, they, they then also get a monitoring kit. So they provide these, these samples back to the labs and that they're then ascertained to see whether it's, it's uh, the K5 that's been killing them or not. So, and where does that sort of like lead to, again, from a community sort of uh, surveillance tool? In the old days, I mean, the, the data came in, it was then assessed, you know, behind closed doors in government. And if you're lucky, the report came out in a month, sometimes a year. Uh, with, with our rabbit biocontrol tracker, which is again leveraging off our feral scan technology, the same sort of platform that I showed you earlier with our wild uh, dog scan technology, this is our, our rabbit, bi rabbit scan biocontrol tracker that not so much in real time, but as soon as the, the, we've got confirmation that the K5 is the actual source of, of the rabbit death, we can then basically plot it on, uh, on our rabbit scan sort of app and then that's easily accessible to the community at large. So it really is trying to sort of create a, 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 not a, so much a real time, but a, a more near, near sort of like real time solution to these issues. And pro by providing that data back to communities, that really does close that loop. It motivates communities to be part of these, these ongoing rollouts. And so we, you know, we see that as a, a really uh, constructive way forward. So, so to wind up, I just wanted to sort of say that you know, if, we, if we're going to keep pests on the run, it really is about sort of ensuring that we can bring different players together to come up with, with shared solutions. And that means looking at you know, large collaborative ventures such as the Cooperative Research Centre. As many of you know that we are winding up in three months' time. Uh, and, that, and, and for others that have been involved in this space, such as the Weed CRC, it's, it's, you'll know that it's a very challenging time and some of these cooperative, cooperative ventures have fallen over and it's taken a long time to rebuild that capability. Fortunately for us, um, the states, uh, the Commonwealth in particular, uh, and the RDCs are rallying behind a new Centre for Invasive Species Solutions. And, uh, and I think particularly, you know, there was a, a very, very positive announcement as part of the election uh, uh, last year when, when uh, the Deputy PM sort of committed 20 million over five years for the new Invasive uh, Solutions Centre. So I think that's a, that really is holding us in a, in a very sort of, in, in a very good position and will enable us to sort of continue these large scale uh, strategic approaches to pest animal management innovation. So I'll leave it there and say thank you.